Time. What is time? If you think about it, we all know what time is, but it's actually harder to come up with the definition than you think it is. And some of you might have been wondering, Pastor Craig came back, and did he put a timer on the stage to make sure I don't go over long micromanaging now that he's back? And no, I put that here on purpose. And it represents to us time. Time is funny because it's not that easy to define. We know what it is because we live in it, and we are stuck in time moving forward. We can't move backwards. We can't really skip into the future. But still, time is pretty strange. Albert Einstein believed, and this kind of has turned out to be true, that space and time are linked together, and they are a function of our material universe, meaning time came into existence when God created the universe. But time is this thing that we have to deal with. And the one thing that is clear about time is that when you put a timer on something, it instantly raises the stakes of what you're doing. So let me give you maybe some examples of what we might talk about about this. Uh, on the one hand, time can feel like at different times for us that it moves at different paces, even though it doesn't. So imagine you go on a date with somebody that you really like, and the date feels like it flies by. Three hours go by and you're talking, and you're like, how did this happen? It, the, it's already late and it's time to go home, and it's crazy, time felt like it moved so fast. On the other hand, imagine that you are sitting in a lecture where you were not allowed to leave, and there are 15 minutes left, just 15 minutes, but you have to go to the bathroom. How long do those 15 minutes feel? They feel like they take forever when that happens. And so when you put a clock on something, you know how much time you have to wait, it can really raise the stakes of things. If you're watching a TV show or a movie, one trick that the writer of a TV show or a movie can do to make the emotional stakes increase is to put a timer on what's going on. They tell you, this is all gonna happen in just one hour. Uh, the example that comes to mind for me was a show that my parents liked and started watching when I was a kid, and that show is called 24. And so the idea of the show is that each season covers 24 hours. So each hour of the show you're watching covers an hour, and you know that everything that is gonna happen to Jack Bauer is going to happen in a 24 hour period. He doesn't get any more time than that. Now that show got increasingly more ridiculous as time went on. You know, in those 24 hours, he was going to be betrayed by his best friend, a loved one was going to die, he was gonna get radiation poisoning, he was going to fake his own death, then he was going to actually die and then be revived, and all of it was gonna happen in this really short period of time. But we know that we feel the emotional weight of something when we know that the time is limited. Imagine even you're watching a sports movie, and in the sports movie, it gets down to the last 30 seconds of the game, 10 seconds of the game, seven seconds of the game. And I still, as a critic by nature, you know, when I watch a movie, I can't help but notice how many times in those sports movies, way more stuff happens in seven seconds than could actually happen in real life. But that's just me nitpicking. But this does make me think, watching a sporting event changes when you know that the time gets short. About two weeks ago, the United States was playing Serbia in basketball in the Olympics. And so some of you may have been watching this with me. The United States has by far the most talented and accomplished team of any of the countries in the world. There was no reason for them not to win. But when they were playing Serbia in the semifinal game before the gold medal game, they were losing by 15 points in the fourth quarter. Now I'll tell you, I was sitting there watching that game, I was trying to study for the sermon that weekend, but I couldn't think about anything else. My stomach was in knots because I know they probably should win the game. They probably will, I think. But the more, as time constricted, the more the stakes increase, they cannot make any more mistakes. Every possession matters. They have to make every shot. Fortunately, Steph Curry did make every shot. But you know that as you get late, the timer squeezes, and you know, I don't have much time. It changes the way that the athletes have to think about what's happening, how much pressure there is on them. And the one idea that I want us to consider for tonight as we finish 1 Corinthians 15 is when we know that we have limited time, it should change the way that we think about what we're doing and why we are doing it. The big idea of the sermon is one sentence, and it's this. The future of God's people is certain, but the time is short. We've been reading about what Paul tells us about the resurrection of the dead. There will be a resurrection of the dead at the end. And so he has made his case in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what we taught you at the beginning. You believed it. We are fools and pitiful 
if we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead and that it's going to happen. Last week, we talked about what our resurrected bodies might indeed look like. So what Paul finishes with here is that he tells us our future, if we are in Christ, is certain. We don't have to worry about it. We will be resurrected. But the truth, though, is that the time is short. There's two simple questions that I want us to answer tonight as we conclude the chapter and feel like we know what we need to know about what's happening for us in the future. First question is this, what will happen at the end of time? That gets addressed in these few verses. And the second thing is, what should we do then with the time that we have? So what's going to happen at the end, and then what should we do with the time that we have? The first of those questions, what will happen at the end of time? I can't tell you everything about it, because Paul does not give us an exhaustive answer, but he tells us some. It starts in verse 50 when he says this, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Last week when Paul was comparing our current bodies to our resurrected bodies we will receive, one of the things that he said about them is that we are sown with perishable bodies, but we will be raised with imperishable bodies. And so he says that to enter into God's kingdom in the future, we cannot enter into that kingdom with our current perishable sinful nature and sinful bodies. Something has to change. We cannot enter into God's presence until we are ready for it. The last point that we had last week was exactly that. Our new bodies will be fit for heaven. They will be fit for God's new creation. And so we have to have a change for us in order to that to ha- for that to happen. We cannot experience the new creation as we are right now. So Paul makes that clear in verse 50. Now, Previously in the chapter, he's told us we're going to be resurrected and be ready, but it leads to another thought, and he picks it up in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, in the first century, you really pick this up in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, many of them viewed Christ's return as imminent, that it was going to happen during their lifetimes. Now, we look back on that and we say, oh, how little you knew. You know, we are 2,000 years later and we're still plugging along. But we know that they were wondering because in 1 Thessalonians, Paul has to answer that question. Some of them were dying and then the rest of them were wondering, what's going to happen to those of us who have died? So they were expecting it to happen soon. And the Corinthians seem to think something similar as well. So he tells this to them. I tell you a mystery, meaning something that has been hidden, but now Paul knows. And he says, we will not all die. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. So the reason Paul says this is because we cannot enter into the kingdom of God, into God's new creation with our bodies the way that they are. So what he says is, those who are alive at the return of Christ In an instant, he says here, in the twinkling of an eye, they will be raised imperishable, and we who are left will be changed. So last week we talked about the fact that the resurrection is not just a resuscitation, it is actually a transformation. And the mystery that Paul is saying is revealed here is that at the time that Christ returns, those who are alive after the resurrection of those who have died will instantly be transformed into their glorified bodies. Really incredible, in this apocalyptic moment at the end, those who are in Christ are instantly going to be changed. He says, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. For some of you, that may ring bells of, if you've read Revelation, in the book of Revelation, it talks about these seven trumpets uh, that will blow, and there's a final trumpet. Is Paul literally talking about the final trumpet in the book of Revelation? Maybe. We don't know. Now, I will tell you, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, had not yet had his vision on the Isle of Patmos yet. So this was written well before that. But Paul's point here is that at the end, at victory, when the final trumpet of victory is blown, this moment is gonna come where everyone who is left who are in Christ, who are believers, who are not yet dead, they will be instantly transformed. Some will be transformed in an instant at the end. He continues, verse 53. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable 
will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, at this moment, this thing that happens at the end, at Christ's return, is the final transformation of those who are alive when Jesus returns, whenever it happens. And he says that at that moment, every prophecy that had been made before about how God would restore the world, the ones that initially were, uh, they were fulfilled in Jesus, but then the culmination of them are going to happen at this moment. And then Paul pulls two passages from the Old Testament to explain what he's talking about. The first comes from Isaiah chapter 25, verses eight and nine. I'm gonna read the entirety of these to you. It says this, he will swallow up death for all time and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Again, this sounds like the book of Revelation. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth for the Lord has spoken and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That's in the book of Isaiah. Now, I want you to keep a couple things in mind. The Jews who were reading the book of Isaiah, they were reading this prophecy in light of the fact that they were not an independent nation. They thought they were God's people, but they kept being subjugated by these other nations of the world. And so Isaiah gives them this prophecy to say that a day is going to come where the death, the uh, the defeat that Israel has experienced is going to be swallowed up in the victory of God's vindication of his people. So the people of Israel are reading this and crying out and longing in their heart, God, restore us to being your people again, and please meet this expectation and this desire of our heart. But what they didn't know is that that longing they had for their nation to be restored was a forethought. It was a, it was a forebearer to the actual deepest desire that all of us have to be completely restored and back with the Lord again. It's interesting to me that in the Old Testament, you know, we have people thinking about things that God cared about, the nation of Israel, but what they didn't know is that God was working on a deeper level all along. And what they didn't know is that a day was going to come when the deepest longings and desires of their heart, even deeper than they know is there, those things are going to be fulfilled at the resurrection and transformation of God's people. And the thing that I want us to consider, because you know, we're talking about things that we don't understand. We're talking about things that we don't really know even what it's gonna look like. But when we are resurrected, or when Jesus returns and transforms us, the thing that I think all of us need to know is that the longings at the depths of our hearts are going to be fulfilled at that moment. The things that we know that we need from God, but even things that on a deeper level than we even understand. The things that we thought we that we think we want uh, compared to the things that we actually need, the deepest needs of our life and desires, those are gonna be completely dealt with, fulfilled, and completely satisfied at the moment that we see God face to face and are transformed into who he made us to be. That moment is going to become, is going to come for us and all is going to be made right. That's what Paul tells us is going to happen at the end. So we have those who are dead, who are raised, and however it's going to happen, you know, God and his power is going to do it. It doesn't matter if they died thousands of years ago and their bodies have completely deteriorated. It doesn't matter, like we said last week, if someone was eaten by a fish and then that fish was eaten by another person. The Lord is going to resurrect his people and we are going to have this moment where we see the victory of Jesus completely culminated in all of God's creation. That is what's going to happen at the end. So if that's true, and Paul gives us certainty that that's what's going to happen, what then do we do with the limited time that we have right now? What do we do with the time that's here? He gives us some pretty good answers in the final verse, verse 58. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. One thing I think is funny about this chapter is Paul literally spends 57 verses arguing with people, using sarcasm, talking about things in the ether way beyond our understanding, and he saves the application point for the final verse. <laughs> he, he puts it in one verse, verse 58. And he says to us three simple things about what we should do with the time that we have left. The first one is this, be steadfast and immovable. 
So our time is short. We should have urgency about what we are going to do. The first thing he tells us is to be steadfast and immovable. Of course, the opposite of this would be to be wavering, uh, easily swayed. But he says that what the Lord desires from you right now in this time and at this place is to be steadfast and immovable. So what does that mean? The first word that comes to mind for me when I think of a steadfast person would be a person who is loyal. Loyal. Now, if any of you here are an employer, you have probably had to deal with the question before about what kind of person should I hire or what kind of employee do I want? Would I rather have a person who is very talented and very competent, but they bring a whole bunch of baggage and problems with them? Maybe they're just loyal. uh, They'll talk about me behind my back. They'll try and undermine me at different times. Do I want that kind of employee? Or would I rather have someone who maybe is not the most talented, but they are loyal? Now, if you're an employer, hopefully you can find both. You know, I hope you find a very talented and very loyal person. But I think that over time, most employers would probably say they would prefer to have someone who is loyal. Because a person who is talented, but they are a snake, they can do things behind your back, they're not loyal to you, they could cause a lot more problems than they could solve. And so what the Lord is looking for, I, I think this is very clear for us to know, our time is short, But that doesn't mean that we should scrape and claw and do everything we can to make a huge dent on the world if it compromises our loyalty to the Lord. God does not necessarily want you to be great. He certainly wants you to be loyal and good to him. God wants us to be loyal. The next thing that the Lord wants is for us to be trustworthy. Now, this idea comes up all over the New Testament that the Lord gives us things to steward while we are here. It's our responsibility for a moment, and what he cares about is that we be diligent and trustworthy with what he's given us. Uh, The parable of the talents that Jesus tells is a good example of this. He, a master, gives different amounts of money to three different people, and what he cares about is what they do with what they've been given. And if you were to look at your life right now and ask, would the Lord say that I have been trustworthy with the gifts, talents, abilities, relationships, responsibilities that he's placed in my life? Have I been trustworthy with it, or have I squandered it? The Lord wants steadfast people who are loyal and trustworthy. And the last thing I would say here is that the Lord wants us to be secure in what we believe. Now, I've chosen these words deliberately. A steadfast, immovable person is secure in what they believe. That does not mean that we are always rigid and certain in everything that we believe. Now, certainly in the essentials of what we believe, we should be certain, but I think you've probably come across people in your life that are extremely rigid and certain about secondary issues, and they do not come across as very godly people. Why is that? Because they're not. That is the descriptor of a legalistic person. A person who is certain that they are right about everything is a person who is certainly wrong about a lot. So I think what the Lord does want us to be, though, I mentioned an antonym for being steadfast or immovable, would be to be easily swayed. We need to be people that are not easily swayed by the world around us, not easily swayed by the most persuasive person that's in your area, not easily swayed by the culture. What the Lord is looking for for you in the short time that you and I have is to be loyal to him, trustworthy with what he gives us, and secure in what we believe, willing to act on it. Now, with that being said, that that speaks to character. That speaks to the kind of person the Lord wants us to be. The second thing Paul says is that we need to be abounding in the work of the Lord. Abounding. Now, when you think of that word abounding, it, it says that you want to be almost excessive. Every part of your life is overflowing with this thing. And what Paul says here is ministry, the work of the Lord, the work of being a believer and ministering to those around us. Now, I feel convicted about this, and I'm sure many of us do as well. We spend a lot of our time and a lot of our energy, and a lot of our talents on many fun things that may not necessarily be the work of the Lord. You know, think about the number of committees maybe that you were involved in, uh, extracurricular hobbies that you do, uh, sporting events that you go to. I mean, all of us have hobbies, hobbies and things that we like to do, and we have the world at our fingertips in a way that people 2,000 years ago did not have, ways that we can spend our time and money and energy that they didn't have. And I worry that many of our most gifted and talented people in the church are using their gifts and uh, talents on things of the world that are 
not bad things, good things, but things that are not ultimately building God's kingdom. So what are we called to do uh, to abound in the works of the Lord? The first one is this. You have to know the gifts that the Lord has given you. You have to be aware of what he's given you. Now, that's two categories. One, that's your natural gifts, meaning some of you were probably born with the gift of gab. You could talk your way in or out of any situation that you want to be a part of. You can talk circles around your parents or your spouse. or Some people just have that kind of gift, and that's a natural gift that comes to somebody. And there are many such gifts. There are also spiritual gifts that the New Testament teaches us clearly, gifts that are given to us at becoming a believer. They come from the Holy Spirit, and the New Testament is very clear. Spiritual gifts are given to us with the intention of us building the body of Christ. That's why they are given. And so I'll just ask a simple question. I'm not gonna make you raise your hand or embarrass you, but if I were to come to you and have a conversation and ask you, do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Could you answer that question? If you're a believer, you should have one or some. Do you know what they are? Uh, If you don't, I think you might wanna pick up the New Testament and look at the passages that talk about spiritual gifts and try and discern and figure out How has God gifted me? Because if you have one of those spiritual gifts, you are meant to use it. The worst thing that you could do is bury the talent that the Lord has given you. So know your gifts. The second one is this. If God has given you a gift, he intends for you to use it, you need to hone your gift. If God has given you a gift, it's meant to be honed. So when God gives a gift, whether it's a natural one, like you are good at talking, or a spiritual gift, that God has given you. So perhaps it is the gift of teaching. It could be the gift of hospitality, the gift of helps. There's a whole list of them in the New Testament. Once you get it, it is not like you get zapped with electricity and you immediately have that gift matured and everything that it should be in the future. God gives you a a gift and you need to develop it. When I started ministry in 2013, so I finished school and I started working at the Woodway campus of our church, I did not know what I was good at. It turns out, not a lot. But I, I didn't know exactly which areas I would excel and which ones that I wouldn't. But I did have an inclination. I did believe that I had the gift of teaching and that God had called me to teach. So I made a conscious decision early on in ministry. Whatever else is going to happen to me, whatever else I do exceed at or whatever else I fail at, which was a lot, that you could tell the pain in my voice that that is true, I said, I'm going to say yes at almost every opportunity to teach because I know the Lord has given me this opportunity and I need to do it. And I had heard a quote from a pastor that said, you don't know what your voice is as a teacher or preacher until you've done it 500 times. That's a lot of times to get up in front of people and talk. So at the Woodway campus for the seven years that I was there, I taught all the time. Every time they said, we need a sub in this class, I said, yes. And I would say on average, I probably taught two to three times a week, every week for about seven years. And I did that Uh, while failing at a lot of other things because I had the conviction that I needed to hone the gift that the Lord has given me. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm very grateful that I made that decision. I'm very grateful. I think the Lord has honored that decision in my life because I knew that he had given me a gift and I decided that I was gonna do everything that I could to hone that gift. And if I'm this bad right now, imagine how bad I would have been if I had not been doing that all this time. So you hone your gifts and then finally, when you know what your gifts are and you've developed them, you then you have to use them. You have to use them. The Lord has put you in the church where he has placed you because he wants to reach people and develop people, one, that don't know him, but two, that are baby Christians. We are here to worship the Lord and build up the body. If God has given you a gift and you know what it is and you've honed it and you're not using it, what are you doing? Your time here is short. Your time here is short. Use the gifts that the Lord has given you. And finally, he says, after you say that you're going to be steadfast and immovable, you abound in the works of the Lord. Finally, he says, know that the things that you do for the Lord are not in vain. Now, I have to tell you honestly that sometimes using your gifts in the church feels like it's happening in vain. Maybe it's that you volunteer to teach in a children's area and it feels like none of the kids are listening to you and they're worse off than when you started (laughs) pouring into them. Maybe it's you're leading a small group and a few weeks into it, there's only two people left and they're the two people you didn't even like. You say, no one say amen to that because you will incriminate yourself. There are times where doing ministry feels like a slog. But the thing that I wanna tell you is this. If the Lord has given you a gift and you've decided with the little bit of time that he's given you to use it, none of those things will be in vain. 
There's a person in, in my life that has influenced me in my faith as much as anyone in my life outside of my parents and my wife. And uh, it's a, a guy named Chad. Chad was my sixth grade basketball coach in, uh, when I was a sixth grader in the church league, extremely competitive, uh, really high level basketball going on there. But he was my sixth grade basketball coach. And then from my freshman year to my senior year in high school, he was the small group leader for my friends and I. And so Chad would meet with us weekly. We would invite him to come hang out with us. He spent so much time with us that he did not have to spend with us. And even beyond high school, Chad stayed involved in my life and in my friends around me in college. And he really, he poured so much of himself into us. And I know, I absolutely know that there were times that Chad probably felt like he was wasting his time with us. You know, there were probably times that we came to him to talk about what was going on with our, uh, you know, exploits trying to get a girlfriend, that he probably didn't want to be a part of that conversation. He was probably bored with what was going on. But he waited and he poured into us, and mostly he modeled what it means to be a godly adult male. That's what he did for my friends and I. But I'm sure that there were times that it felt like he was toiling and there wasn't much going on. And the thing that I want to tell you is this. Uh, I can tell you with certainty, because I am one of the fruits of that, nothing that Chad did in my life was in vain. None of it. Every conversation he had with me, every time he taught my friends and I, every time he listened to me, none of those moments were in vain. And Chad didn't just do that for my friends and I. I mean, he, he had a rotating group of people that were always in his life and he was pouring into. In fact, my first year of doing ministry, I, I told Chad, I said, I'm going to the Woodway campus, it's expensive there, I don't really know what I'm doing, I'm poor, you know, but I'm excited. And he said, why don't you come live in my extra bedroom in my condo? I was guy number, I think, 12 or 13 that he had done that for. He let people come in and live in his house during transitional moments of their life. And, you know, for me, that meant everything. I mean, I was basically a child. I mean, I was 25 years old, but I had no idea what I was doing with my life. And Chad kept pouring into me from the time that I was in sixth grade and in high school and then as an adult. And when the end comes, and that moment comes where we are transformed or raised, I can't wait for God to show me and everyone else around us the fruit that Chad's life bore. Every decision that he made was for a reason and on purpose. Nothing that he did in our lives and for my friends and I was in vain. And so the final thing that I would say to you is this, because I see that our time is over as far as my timer is concerned, but your time is almost over as well. What are you gonna do with it? 